Hello again, guys. So we will proceed to the discussion of pair operative nursing, starting it starting out with intraoperative phase. So we're now in the intraoperative phase of perioperative. So goals here are to maintain asepsis, homeostasis, and the safe administration of anesthesia, and of course, hemostasis as well. That's pertaining to the blood. That's why blood products are also necessary during the intraoperative intra phase. So we go to the surgical setting. In the surgical setting, the we have the unrestricted area, and this provides as an entrance and exit from the surgical suite, from personnel to um, for personnel equipment and the patient. Street clothes are permitted in this area, and this area also provides access to communication with the personnel within the suite and with personnel and patients' families outside the suite. So that's the unrestricted area. So meaning you can go into this area with your casual wear, your street clothes, whatever you want to wear in that area if you're a nurse. But usually for nurses, the, um, we wear scrub suits prior to the entry in the operating room. The semi-restricted area, this provides access to the procedure rooms and peripheral support areas within the surgical suite. So the person enter, personnel entering this area must be in proper operating room attire, such as scrub suit, and traffic control must be designed to prevent violation of this area by unauthorized persons. So in the semi-restricted area, this is the point wherein watchers of the patients or other uh, family members are no longer allowed. So they are only allowed in the unrestricted area. Peripheral support areas consists of the storage areas for clean and sterile, uh, sterile supplies, sterilization equipment, and corridors leading to the procedure room. So this is where the clean and sterile supplies are stored. The sterilization is, equipment is also there. And corridors to the OR are also within the semi-restricted area. Now, we go to the restricted area. This includes the procedure room where the surgery is performed and adjacent substerial areas where the scrub sinks and autoclaves are located. Personnel working in this area must be in proper operating room attire. So once you're already in the restricted area, people here should already be wearing scrub suits for the circulating nurse or for, for the anesthesiologist. While those who are going to engage with the surgery itself, they need to wear um, their, the gowns, operating gowns, in order to be sterile. These gowns are sterile. So this is an example of the setup of the operating room suite. So you can see there the anesthesia department, the OR suite, there are different OR suites there. Uh, the operating room that I've worked with before in EPH, they have two operating rooms there. And uh, beside the OR, the recovery room is also there. There's the storage, nurse station, medical nurses dressing room. So we there should be a dressing room as well for nurses and doctors to change into their scrub suits. The OR supervisor office and the lounge is there. In the lounge area, that's where family members are allowed to stay. Or if they, if they need to give something to the doctor, like medications and such, they should be there. 
So this is another setup of the operating room. Environmental safety. The size of the procedure room should be taken into consideration as well. Temperature and humidity control should be checked. Ventilation and air exchange system. Electrical safety as well should be done and communication system. When we need to have, before when phone, uh, cell phones were not yet common, they used telephones inside or intercoms within the hospital. I think most hospitals still have intercoms because it's uh, a foolproof way to communicate with the other personnel at the hospital. Size of the procedure room, usually rectangular or square in shape, 20 by 20 by 10, with a minimum floor space of 360 square feet. Each procedure room must have the following equipment. You have the communication system, which is the intercom, oxygen and vacuum outlets, mechanical ventilation assistance equipment, respiratory and cardiac monitoring equipment, x-ray film elimination boxes, cardiac defibrillator should also be there. High efficiency particulate air filters, adequate room lighting and emergency lighting system. Just in case power outages can occur, there should be emergency light. X-ray, you know, you know this X-ray film elimination boxes. This is where the doctors are going to play, place X-ray films in order to check for them. Let's say, for example, they are going to operate on the bones of the patient if they need to. Um, check the x-ray film on which site to operate, they can place it there. Temperature and humidity control. The temperature in the procedure room should be maintained between 68 to 75 Fahrenheit or 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. So it should be air conditioned. Should be air conditioned. Humidity level should be around 50 to 55% at all times. Ventilation and air exchange system. Air exchange in each procedure room should be at least 25 air exchanges every hour. And five of that should be fresh air. A high filtration particulate filter working at 95% efficiency is recommended. So each procedure room should be maintained with positive pressure with forces which forces the old air out of the room and prevents air from the surrounding airs from entering into the procedure room. That, this is very, very important because um, air can contain dust, can contain particles that can go into the operative site of the patient. So ventilation and exchange, air exchange system is also important to set up in the OR. Electrical safety. So faulty wiring, excessive use of extension cords, poorly maintained equipment, and lack of current safety measures are just some of the hot hazardous factors that must be constantly che checked. So make sure that the extension cords are properly in place because they can trip the surgeon or the, the scrub nurse. So make sure that they are in place. All electrical equipment new and or used should be routinely checked by qualified personnel. And equipment that fails to function at 100% efficiency should be taken out of service immediately. So it should be removed out of the OR. Next is the surgical team. Of course, we have the patient that uh, the doctors are going to operate on, the anesthesiologist or anesthetist anesthetist, the surgeon, the scrub nurse, circulating nurse, the RNFA, regular nurse first assistant, and the surgical technologists, if necessary. The difference between the anesthesiologist and the anesthetist, anesthesiologist can, uh, is always a doctor, medical doctor. Well, the anesthetist can be a trained nurse, for example, a nurse anesthetist. So this is the surgeon, the one doing the job in the OR, the star of the OR. 
responsibilities are the following. They are primarily responsible for the preoperative medical history and physical assessment. They also, uh, the performance of operative procedure according to the needs of the patient. So they are the ones doing the operation, of course. And the primary decision maker regarding surgical technique to use during the procedure. They may assist with positioning and prepping the patient or may delegate this task to the other members of the team. Since some, the prepping can be done by the nurse. First assistant to the surgeon. Responsibilities may be a resident, resident physician, an intern, physician's assistant, or a perioperative nurse. I had my fair share of experience being an, a perioperative nurse before. So here, we can assist in retracting, hemostasis, suturing, and any other tasks required by the surgeon to facilitate speed while maintaining quality during the procedure. Um, take note, if nurses can also be trained in doing suturing. I have worked with a senior nurse before at PPH. I, I think he's already retired now. He is the one closing up the patient once the surgeon is already done with the surgery. The nurse, the senior nurse there, is the one doing the suturing. So he's the one closing up the abdomen once the surgeon is finished. We can also assist in the retraction. If they tell you to retract a certain skin or whatsoever in order for the surgeon to visualize the internal organs, we can do that. Now we go to the anesthesiologist. Their responsibilities is to select the anesthesia, administer it, intubate the client if necessary, and manages manages technical problems related to the administration of anesthetic agents and supervises the client's condition throughout the surgical procedure. A physician who specializes in the administration and monitoring of anesthesia while maintaining the overall well-being of the patient. So that's their responsibility. They should take note always of the vital signs of the patient. But sometimes this is being delegated to the circulating nurse. Now we go to the scrub nurse. So maybe a nurse or a surgical technician could do this. Reviews anatomy and physiology of the surgical procedures. That's why anatomy and physiology is very, very important in surgery. We assist with the preparation of the room. Scrub, gowns and gloves, self and other members of the surgical team will be used. Prepares the instrument table and organizes sterile equipment for functional use. So that's our responsibility. We prepare the instrument table and organize it. Organize which instruments are going to be used first in order to facilitate easy, um, easy surgery and assist with the draping procedure as well when the patient is going to be draped. Passes instruments to the surgeon and assist assistance by anticipating their need. If you are already well-trained in the operating room, you know which um, instrument you are going to pass next. Let's say, for example, you are going to assist in the patient's or in the doctor's CS. That type of operation, CS. The first thing that you are going to pass to the surgeon would be, of course, the scalpel. And you should know certain techniques in passing instruments. We nurses, when we pass instruments, make sure that we are passing the handle, not the end or the blade part of the scalpel will be passed to the doctor. No, that is wrong. It should always be the handle it, together with the other clamps like the Kelly or Alice. You need to know which ones will be used by the surgeon because you need to anticipate their need. Like for example, in CS, scalpel after scalpel, you give 
Kelly clamps, Alice clamps, and so on. After that, we count sponges, needles, and instruments before the patient, uh, before the doctor is going to close up the patient. If that is very, very important, we need to count the instruments first together with the sponges that were used to prevent loss and to prevent retention of sponges into the patient's abdominal cavity, for example. And monitor practices of aseptic technique in self and others. Keeps tracks of irrigations used for calculations of blood loss. Circulating nurse. Responsibility of the circulating nurse. Of course, they should be registered nurses who, after additional education and training, specializes in perioperative nursing practice. Responsible and accountable for all activities occurring during a surgical procedure in including the management of personal equipment, supplies, and the environment during a surgical procedure. Let's say, for example, you're a surgical, uh, you're a circulating nurse. One of the roles, if the surgeon needs more instruments, one of the roles of the circulating nurse is to get these instruments and pass it to the surgical team during the surgery. And they should maintain proper asepsis as well in passing these things. You will learn more of those in your RLE class. So patient advocate, teacher, research consumer, leader, and a role model. They also may be responsible for monitoring the patient during local procedures if a second pair operative nurse is not available. So one of the functions of the circulating nurse is to monitor the patient's vital signs because the scrub nurse cannot do that. Very defined activities during surgery. Ensures all equipment is working properly, guarantees sterility of instruments and supplies, assists with the positioning, monitor the room and team members for breaks in the sterile technique. That is very, very important. That's why there are certain maneuvers or techniques done inside the operating room in order to avoid breaking the sterile or breaking the asepsis of the operating table. You will be taught those things in your RLE classes as well. Handle specimens if specimens are needed. Coordinates activities with other departments such as radiology and pathology. Documents care provided, so that's one of our tasks as well in, in the OR to uh, document what has happened during the procedure. So you're going to chart that as well. And minimizes conversation and traffic within the operating room suite. So once you are engaged in the operation, conversation should be minimized because um, you might break the sterile technique. Medical versus surgical asepsis. So for medical asepsis, this reduces the number of pathogens. This is referred to as the clean technique. And used in the administration of medications, enemas, to feedings, and daily hygiene. And hand washing is number one in medical asepsis. But for surgical asepsis, it eliminates all pathogens. And it's referred to as the sterile technique. So used in dressing changes, catheterizations, and surgical procedures. So that's the difference between the two. So take note, for medical, reduce number of pathogens. For surgical, pathogen should be zero. Principles of surgical asepsis, sterile technique. Sterile object remains sterile only when touched by another sterile object. So... It's one of the principles. Sterile to sterile materials. Only sterile objects may be placed on a sterile field. That's why you can, um, for us as scrub nurse, it's our responsibility to place all similar objects together, such as the Kelly clamp, the Alice clamp. A sterile object or field out of range of vision or an object held below a person's waist, for example. Everything that is below our waist is considered unsterile. So if you put the instrument lower than your waist, that is already considered contaminated. 
When a sterile surface can, comes in contact with a wet contaminated surface, the sterile object or field becomes contaminated by capillary action. So, for example, if you have already used the, let's say, for example, the clamps, the Kelly or Alice, do not put it back to the sterile table for instruments. It should be put placed in the unsterile table. Fluid flows in a different direction of gravity so the edges of the sterile field or container are considered contaminated one inch common surgical incisions are the following we have the butterfly incision limbal halsted elliptical subcostal paramedian transverse rectus mcburney which is for appendicitis penance tail and lumbo Lumbotomy. So these are the common surgical incisions. I will assign you a homework with regards to this on with regards to the description of each and pictures of these types of incision sites. So I'll be assigning you this on Google Classroom. Position during surgery, supine or dorsal recumbent. Abdominal, this is done for abdominal extremity, vascular, chest, neck, facial, ear, and breast surgery. Positioning techniques, patient lies flat on the back with arms either extended on arm boards or placed along the side of the body. But it's more appropriate just to have them extended on arm boards in order for us to monitor the patient's vital signs. Small padding placed under the patient's head or neck under knee and under the knees. Vulnerable pressure points should also be padded if it's a prolonged surgery, especially if the surgery is a brain surgery. Safety strap applied two inches above knees. And I should be protected by using an eye patch or ointment since the lights for surgery are very glaring. Prone position. These surgeries involving posterior surface of the body, such as the spine. Let's say, for example, the doctor is going to do spinal surgery or the back of the neck, the buttocks, or the lower extremities as well. Positioning techniques, chest rolls or bolsters are placed on the operating table prior to positioning. Foam headrest, head turned to side or facing downward. Sometimes the OR Table has a hole for the face, like that of a massage table. If the type of operation is going to be done in prone position, patient's arms are rotated to the padded arm boards that, fa that face head, bringing them to their normal range of motion. Padding for knees and pillow for lower extremities to prevent toes from touching the matches are needed as well. And safety strap is applied two inches above. <laughs> the knees for this patient. Trendelenburg. These are surgeries involving the lower abdomen, pelvic organ when there is a need to tilt abdominal viscera away from the pelvic area. So in Trendelenburg position, if they are going to do surgery on the urinary bladder, for example, or on the uterus, or any other pelvic organs, they need to position this because Trendelenburg position will allow the force of gravity to pull the other abdominal organs away from the pelvic area. So positioning techniques, patient is so fine with the head lower than feet. Shoulder braces should not be used as they may cause damage to the brachial plexus due to the gravity. So that's avoided. When patient is returned to supine position, care must be taken. Move leg section slowly, then entire table to level position. Modification of this position can be used for hypovolemic shock. So if the hypovolemic shock occurs in a patient, they can modify the position of the patient. And extremity position and safety straps are the same for that of the supine. Now we go to the reverse Trendelenburg position. This is done for ab upper abdominal, head, neck, and facial surgery. 
So it's reverse Trendelenburg. Pa positioning technique patient is to find with head higher than feet now. So the head is higher than the feet. Most especially if facial surgery is going to be done. Small pillow is placed under the neck and knees. Well padded footboard should be used to prevent slippage to the foot of the bed or the table. Anti-embolic hose should be used if position is to be maintained for longer for an extended period of time, especially if brain surgery is going to be done. And patient should be returned slowly to the supine position once the surgery is over. So you put the patient slowly, step by step, into a supine position. Lithotomy. This type of position is needed if you are if the doctor is going to operate on the perineal area, vaginal, rectal surgeries, or hemorrhoids, for example, or combined abdominal and vaginal procedures. So positioning techniques, patients placed in supine position with buttocks near lower break in the table. Sacrum are should be well padded. Feet are placed on stirrups. Stirrups height should not be excessively high or low, but even on both sides. Knee braces must not compress vascular structures or nerves in the popliteal space. And pressure from metal stirrups against upper inner aspect of thigh and calf should be avoided. So legs should be raised and lowered slowly and simultaneously. This is uh, Two people is required to do this since legs can be heavy, especially if you are handling obese patients. Modified Fowlers or sitting position. Autorhinology, ear or nose surgeries or neurosurgery. Most of the time for neurosurgery, the patient is in a sitting position. Especially if the parietal aspect of the brain is going to be operated on. So positioning techniques, patient is supine position over the upper break of the table. Backrest is elevated and knees are flexed. Arm rests on pillow, placed in lap, safety straps two inches above the knees should be placed. Slow movement in and out of position must be used to prevent drastic changes in blood volume movement. Anti-embolic hose should be used to assist ve venous return since neurosurgeries will take a lot, uh, it will take too much time to do this. When using special neurologic headrest eyes, must be protected as well. Jackknife possession. In jackknife possession, this is required for rectal procedures, sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. So how do we do this? How do we position them? Tables flex at center break. All precautions taken when prone position are taken with jackknife position. And table strap is applied over the thighs. In jackknife jack knife position, it's quite similar to Sims position in order for the doctor to visualize the colon of the patient if sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy is going to be done. Now we talk about anesthesia. Anesthesia will cause a state of narcosis. Anesthetics can produce muscle relaxation, blood transmission of pain, nerve impulses, and suppresses reflexes. It can also temporarily decrease memory retrieval and recall. That's why during the state of anesthesia, the patient cannot recall the incidences that has happened during the surgery. The effects of anesthesia are monitored consider by considering the following parameters. Respiration, the O2 saturation, carbon dioxide levels, heart rate and BP, and the urine output. That's why it's the responsibility of the anesthesiologist or us nurses to monitor these things from the patient. Types of anesthesia. We have general anesthesia. There's reversible state consisting of complete loss of consciousness and sensation. Protective reflexes such as cough, or gag reflex are lost as well, provides analgesia, muscle relaxation, and sedation, and produces amnesia and hypnosis. Because patients who are under general anesthesia, they are completely 
in a sleep state. So there's loss of consciousness here and they cannot feel anything. And of course, since you are, since the patient is having loss of consciousness, they, they are unconscious, they can't remember anything that will be done on them. Techniques used in general anesthesia. Intravenous anesthesia. This being administered intravenously and extremely rapid, its effect will immediately take place after 30 minutes of introduction and it prepares the client for smooth transitioning to the surgical anesthesia. But the more common one, which is inhalation anesthesia, this comprises of volatile, volatile liquids or gas and oxygen. So this administered through a mask or endotracheal tube, but masks are more common. Before the anesthesiologist will administer this or give the mask for anesthesia, the anesthesiologist will let the patient count. And until the patient will lose their consciousness. You can always see this in medical drama. Stages of general anesthesia. Stage one, onset, induction. Stage two, excitement, delirium. Stage three, surgical, and they should not proceed to stage four, which is medullary or stage of danger. So these are the different stages of anesthesia. Regional anesthesia, temporary interruption of the transmission of nerve impulses to and from specific areas or regions of the body. And it's achieved by injecting local anesthetics in close proximity to appropriate nerves. This reduces all painful sensation in one region of the body without inducing unconsciousness. And agents that are used for this are lidocaine and bupivacaine. Usually, um, they do this through injecting anesthesia in the spinal canal or spinal cord. It's injected between L3 and L4. And the patient, or usually this type of anesthesia, they are um, doing this for patients who will undergo CS, CS deliveries, or any other abdominal procedure or lower abdominal procedure that is going to be done on the patient. So they will inject the anesthesia is injected into the subarachnoid space between the L3 and the L4. Topical anesthesia. It's applied directly to the skin and mucous membranes, open skin surfaces, wounds, and burns. It's readily absorbed and act rapidly. Used topical agents are lidocaine and benzocaine. So if the patient has burns, for example, or aching wounds, they can apply this. Spinal anesthesia. This subarachnoid block. This is what I was talking about. Local anesthetic is injected through the lumbar puncture between L2 and S1. Some L3 or L4. Anesthetic agent is injected into the subarachnoid space surrounding the spinal cord. So for low spinal, this is done for low spinal, for perineal or rectal areas. Mid spinal around T10, below the level of umbilicus for hernia repair and appendectomy. High spinal T4, nipple line for CS. So agents used are protein, tetracaine, lidocaine, and bupivacaine. So any of those types of anesthetics can be used. So as you can see there, they will inject the anesthesia here into the subarachnoid space. That's why proper positioning should be done by the patient. You will, or the anesthesiologist is going to position the patient in a sideline position. And in order to expose the opening in between the vertebrae, they are going to let the patient assume a knee chest position. Epidural anesthesia, it's achieved by injecting local anesthetics into the epidural space by way of lumbar puncture. 
So result is similar to spinal anesthesia or analgesia. Agents used are chloroprocaine, lidocaine, bupivacaine. Peripheral nerve block used by injecting a local anesthetic to anesthetize the surgical site. So peripheral nerves are going to be blocked here. If they are going to do, let's say, for example, orthopedic surgery on one of the limbs, they can use that as well. They will block the nerve, main nerve supplying the limb. So agents used here, again, are the same chloroprocaine, lidocaine, and bupivacaine. Intravenous block, this is often used for arm, wrist, and hand procedure. And an occlusion tourniquet is applied into the extremity to prevent infiltration and absorption of the injected IV agents beyond the involved extremity. So that tourniquet is very, very important there to prevent those things from happening. Caudal anesthesia is done or is produced by injection of the local anesthetic into the caudal or sacral canal. So this is in the sacral area, sacral. Field block anesthesia. These, the area proximal to the planned incision can be injected and infiltrated with local anesthetic agents. So... Let's say, for example, um, the patient is going to undergo circumcision. They will inject the anesthetic agent near to the penis or to the um, genitalia in order for circumcision to be done. That's a field block type of anesthesia. So we now go to the nursing management. Complications and discomfort of anesthesia. One would be hypoventilation. There's inadequate ventil ventilatory support after paralysis of respiratory muscles because the respiratory muscles can be paralyzed during anesthesia. So we need to check every now and then the patient's respiratory rate. Oral trauma as well can occur. So most especially if endotracheal type of anesthesia is going to be done. Malignant hyperthermia due to uncontrolled skeletal muscle contraction that can occur. That's why we need to monitor the patient's temperature as well. Hypotension due to preoperative hypovolemia or untoward reactions to anesthetic agents. That's why of all the vital signs, the ones that we are constantly checking is the blood pressure. We are monitoring it every 15 minutes or according to what the, the anesthesiology just wants to, according to the frequency that the anesthesiologist wants. Cardiac dysrhythmias can occur due to pre-existing cardiovascular compromise, electrolyte imbalance, or untoward reaction to anesthesia. That's why it's very, very important to check for the cardiopulmonary status of the patient before the patient will undergo a surgery because this can happen brought about by anesthesia. So if the patient is having a heart problem, they cannot be cleared for surgery. Hypothermia due to the exposure to a cool ambient OR environment and loss of thermal regulation capacity from anesthesia. Remember, the OR is air conditioned, so this can occur. Peripheral nerve damage can occur due to improper positioning of the patient or use of restraints. That's why we are not going to um, place the restraints tightly on the patient because this can happen. Nausea and vomiting can occur due to anesthesia and headache. Okay, we'll skip this part. So that's it with regards to the intraoperative phase. Our next topic for next meeting would be would, uh, regarding post-op care. So if you have any questions with regards to our 
intraoperative patient care or intraop risk nursing responsibilities, please do not hesitate to message me about this topic. So read in advance as well the topic on post-op nursing care. Again, thank you everyone for um, watching today's video regarding intraoperative nursing and have a great day.